Um, well, <laughs> um, I was telling Zanita I'm still processing, and I'm usually not one that it takes long to process stuff. I can usually process it pretty quickly, I mean, you know, <laughs> but there's so much. There was, I don't know how many of you got to see any of the meetings, but there was, it was just so good. So what uh, We went to Flashpoint uh, Live in Pensacola. Uh, Thursday night, Mike Lindell, Lance Wallnow, Dutch Sheets, a precious, precious black, young black pastor. I've not heard of him, but oh my goodness, he was so filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and let's see, who else? Hank. Uh, Hank Kuhneman. And then the next day was more like a training session, but it was an eye-opening <coughs> session. We just think we know what is happening outside the walls of the church, but we do not. And I'm telling you, it would, it just grieved me to hear some of the things that we heard. But the training part was, and the big takeaway, I think that, well, there were so many, but, but the biggest one was for several generations now, the church has been doing Mark, and I was wanting to make sure, 16, 15 through 18. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. You know, these signs shall follow those that believe. But Satan and the world, they've been doing Matthew uh, 28, 19, and 20, which is do the same thing, but make disciples. And we have not made disciples. You know, I look at our boys and I think, all their heads came up. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is you're doing, stop. <laughs> but um, while we have been busy doing church, Satan and the world, they've been busy seducing our children, yes. sexualizing the entire culture, yes. and absolutely taking control of all of the main segments of our culture and our society. Yes. And, you know, that, that just hit me. Bo, you've talked about so much of that. But when you, when you really hear and you see people from all around the country and you hear some of the things that we heard, you realize, you know, we're so comfortable. We really are. We love doing church stuff and coming to church. But I was, I was just asking the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, I keep saying, but... What is that supposed to look like for me personally? What am I personally supposed to be doing? And I was reading about, one of the translations I was reading was uh, about going into all the world and making disciples, openly sharing the gospel, openly making your beliefs and the word of God and the living aspect of what the gospel really is. I have not done that. I, I, you know, I guess we do it to other church people. Well, what good does that do? I mean, that's like preaching to the choir. And so I just, you know, I came away from that just so encouraged, so discouraged, <laughs> and then so encouraged again. <clears throat> Discouraged that we've not done more. Yeah. Encouraged that it isn't over yet. That's yeah. right. Amen. And, you know, I have been praying. We've prayed at Monday night prayer meeting. 
Um, I have prayed so long for a youth pastor because we have so many wonderful young people in here. And I believe, you know, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> and I, we, we, it, all the things that we have done, there's, there's, they're good things. But I want to see our church body, our young men and women, I want to see them taught and encouraged and shown the way because they seem to hear it better when it's not from mama and daddy. They will remember hearing it, but they seem to get excited and hearing about it. So join with me to pray. I mean, I, I, I actually thought, you know, Lord, we've sent throughout all of our Christian life, I, I mean, we've given untold amounts. I don't know. I mean, not huge, but to, to missions, and I'm thinking, dear Lord, we've got a mission field right here. We've got a mission field right there, and we need to be doing more. We just need to be doing more. And I hope, and that was so funny, because if you saw the last night with Gene Bailey, did y'all see that? Mm -hmm. he, um, he's the moderator of Flashpoint. I've never seen him do that, but he, he walked up to the pastor there. I think he was the first one, or maybe it was Hank. Anyway, he said, you know, the Lord says you want more. And he reached his hands out and he touched him. You would have had there to, been there to see it. This man didn't just kind of fall down. It was, yeah. I mean, it was like an electric charge just went through him. And three or four people. The last night, we were thinking we were going to hear more teaching. It was, I'm, I'm forced. We, it was praise and worship. There were some words of encouragement, but it was just praise and worship the whole time. And um, you'll have to ask Rick about this when he gets here. And this is the most, I was telling Danita, I had something happen. We had something happen on the way back to the hotel the last night. Never had anything happen like this before. I'm not a person that sees angels or things like that. Never had been. Just, I'm not. And I was driving and our friends Sammy and Sue were in the back seat. Rick was in the passenger seat. We were between Brownsville and our hotel, which was kind of on the outskirts of Pensacola. And it was like 1030 at night. It was dark. There was a few houses with some lights, um, but no street lights and no business lights. And I was driving and all of a sudden, directly in my line of vision, the most beautiful jewel light every color of the rainbow. I have never seen anything like it. Brilliant, but moving. And I was just, my mouth just came open for about three seconds. I couldn't say anything. That's hard to believe. <laughs> but I said, look. And Rick looked and he said, wow. And Sue looked and she said, Oh, I see it. It was like, you know how a DNA helix kind of goes together and moves? And it was kind of like that. It was transparent, but it was brilliant. And it was moving with us. We could see the leaves on the trees through it, and yet it was the most brilliant colors in the world. Sammy was, I don't know if he was looking out the wrong window or what, <laughs> but he said, where? I don't see it. I don't see it. Well, by that time, I, I don't know if I just, because I was still trying to drive and watch. I mean, it was just, <clears throat> but it just went away. And we were all just dumbfounded. And, and we were like, what was that? <laughs> I do not know, the, I, I went to bed thinking about it, I woke up thinking about it, I've been thinking about it ever since. I don't know, except I do know it had something to do with God. And it was the most beautiful thing 
Sue described it as kind of like if you go to one of those light shows, you know, the laser shows. She said, but man, those are nothing compared to what this was. So I don't know. I said, well, Lord, are you just showing us that just to let us know that you're getting ready to start really doing more? And, and it's going to take more. It really is going to take more. But I, I'm going to tell you, it was amazing. And God does want us doing more. So, that's my takeaway. <laughs> I just wanted to share something that the Lord, I feel like the Lord showed me this, this week. I'm not given divisions or anything, but I just, I've been thinking about this revival uh, that started at, at uh, uh, Asbury, and it's already spreading. You know, that that's Asbury is, has been you know Dutch Sheets talks about wells of revival and, and that has been a well of revival literally for decades uh, it, and, and where there's been big revivals there have been things that have started at Asbury and, and I remember you know with the, the laughter uh, and the that when that time of revival was happening I was at Bible school up at the uh, Minnesota, Bethany, and two students came from Asbury and brought revival to our school because they had had revival break, break out in Asbury. And so, so this is this is the real deal. Is I guess what I'm trying to get across to you is what we've been praying for uh, for decades. And this is I really truly believe this is the revival that uh, that Brother Arthur Burt uh, hung on to to see. You know. Uh, where uh, it would have no end. What the word that he had was that arms and legs would come down from heaven and this would be a, 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 an awakening, a revival that would have no end. You know, there's always been a, you know, uh, a, a coming of revival and then a having. A coming and a having. This would be one that would have no end. So I believe that's what's happening. Uh, but what, what I saw... You know, there, there are forces at work to, you know, as Jane was saying, to you know, take our youth, to destroy this nation, to destroy and, and bring about the end, basically. And it, and it doesn't make, you know, from our perspective, it doesn't make sense. Like, why would Satan want to bring about the end? You know, because he, he, he is destroyed in the end. Why would he want that coming sooner? And, and I, uh, I believe that he does want it coming sooner because he's the prince uh, prince of deception but he is also self-deceived mm -hmm. and he thinks that if he can control the timing yeah. of the end he can control the outcome right. of the end and so that's what's going on now and and all of this that's you know the, the whole globalist thing the whole you know, one world government, everything, you know, the stickling of the last election, uh, the, you know, the virus that is intentional, all of this stuff that is pushing us towards control, control, and having, uh, you know, a one world government control, all of this, you know, the enemy thinks that it's unstoppable now. That's why they're more in the open. It used to be that they was, oh no no no, we're not we're not doing anything like that. Oh, no, 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 no. You stay, you know, you know, they're, they're like Bo has talked about that. Say one thing, oh, and then when they get called on it, they'll go, well, they they're they're, they're not <coughs> even doing that now. They're like, you know, it's just right out there in the open what their plans are, and it's because they think at this point with the, you know, everything they got in place that it's unstoppable. And the image that I had this week, you know, when I was just thinking about the revival and everything, was of the Titanic. The Titanic was a, a ship that uh, they even said, the people that built it said, this is a ship that God himself could not sink. <coughs> that God himself could not sink. And, um, and so that's what I think this whole system that's put, been put in place by the forces of evil to, to destroy and take over the world they think we've got it 
This is a ship that can't be sunk. This is something, This what we put in place is a ship that can't be sunk. And what I saw this week was that ship hit the iceberg. Amen. And that iceberg is revival. This oh, yes. iceberg is what has begun. And, and you know, I've never seen the movie through Titanic, but I've seen like some scenes from it and stuff. And the, the scenes that I just saw when I, when I thought about that this ship has hit the iceberg was the water just coming in, unstoppable. You know, I've, I've showed Mary Virginia has seen it pulled up on the you know, internet just of like this door, the, the water's pushing on this door and they're looking at it and they're in this hallway and they're trying to get away and then <clears throat> that door just blows open and water's just unstoppable going everywhere so fast and this ship that they said God himself could not sink literally within hours of hitting that iceberg it was gone that's what I felt like the Lord was saying. All of the stuff that they think is unsinkable, it's just hit the iceberg. And it's going to happen so fast, this water of revival. And they're just stunned. They're stunned at what is going to happen. And that sink, that ship that is unsinkable is going to sink from all of this revival that's happening. So. Well, there's one thing. Um, there was the man who spoke on Friday, and he was talking about, he's the one who's head of Patriot Academy that trains young college students, young adults, high school students in biblical governance. Yes, you know? Rick Green. Yes, Rick Green. And <clears throat> he was saying that one thing that the church has got to get away from and realize is that we have been sold on the idea of safety. He said it started, you know, yes it did. And he said, but he said it has progressively gotten to the point that our mindset is we've got to be safe. We've got to be safe. And he said, you know, everywhere I go it's like, Stay six feet away. Be safe. Stick feet away. Be safe. Mask up. Be safe. You know, whatever. Don't go anywhere that you'll see anybody. Just be safe. And he said, that is the idea that the church has had. Just, just be safe. Just do what you've always done. Just preach what you've always preached. Just be safe. And he said, he, some of his guys that were teaching, they were in the airport somewhere right after they opened the airports and he said we had a wonderful meeting and he said um, I was texting them all thanks and he said because we went on different planes and he said and I wrote be safe and he said something rose up inside me and he said I hit delete delete it all and he said I texted in bold print be Dangerous. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, when the church gets dangerous, like that wall of water that was yes. coming, Amen. that's when they sink. Yes. Let's be dangerous. Yes, I've been very close. Ron was in China and we were traveling, and uh, <clears throat> so we're on this train going to Beijing 36 hours, and uh, we saw. Uh, African students that were coming by our compartment. They kept coming by. We had every food that could be eaten that's instant that we took to China in 1990. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, you know, we should invite those boys to come in and eat a meal with us. We did. Well, those boys had backpacks on their shoulders filled with bottles, and they were evangelizing Africa on the campuses. Yeah. So the college camp, I mean China, they were evangelized from Africa, they were from Beijing, they spoke French, and so we started praying for China, praying and praying for China. I don't know whether they were speaking in tongues or Beijing, the <laughs> language, French, but they, we just kept praying and praying and praying. And I felt like those missiles of prayer were going up all over China as we traveled. 
then when I got home, I got a word from the Lord that changed our youngest son, a prodigal, brought him back home. And the word was this, 1990, okay, I saw myself going from church to church to church, standing on a chair and saying, wake up America. Well, the church did not wake up, and that's where we are now. But he told me, I heard this sound, and I thought, oh, it sounds like the floodgates at Morgan Falls, that where they open the gates of the Chattahoochee, and they tell people, get off, get safe, get safe. Okay, so I heard that sound. The Lord said, I've opened the floodgates. I've opened the floodgates of good and of evil. And those who do not hide themselves in the rock, me, Jesus, will not survive. Now that's the message that we need to give to people. They need to know they will not survive if they do not hide themselves in the rock, Jesus. And when Ray heard that, he was on every kind of drug you can imagine, my youngest son, and he turned and came to the Lord. So the message we need to give is dangerous. Yes. Danger. Danger is here. We have to hide ourselves in Jesus. We have to quit playing church and do what God has called us to do, and which is to make the song. Amen. Well, anyone else? <laughs> Uh, just uh, kind of a little update on this, Barry. Uh, the president of the school has decided that they are going to cease having services this week. I don't remember the exact date. I think the last open service was tonight, right? Is that right? I don't remember. Anyway, they have it posted on the Asbury webpage. Um, and, and you may say, and I know they're going to get criticism for this from people say, well, what are you doing? You're cutting off what the Lord is doing. God never called a school to handle his presence. That's right. yeah. He called the church to handle his presence. They're overwhelmed. Yeah. They're a small school in a small town. And yesterday they had 20,000 people on the lawn. Wow. <laughs> that's not in the buildings, that's on the lawn. And all these people have to be fed, they've had to get security in there, they've had to get this expense and that expense and this other expense. And, and the president just finally said, we can't handle this. So they're giving it off to the churches. Yeah. Where it belongs. Where it belongs. Okay. Because he said, that's not our job. Our job is to train people, not to host this. So you can look on the uh, website to see. I can't remember exactly, I think, but it's Sunday this week. I think it's Thursday. Uh, is it Thursday? Okay. Um, but, you know, as you look at what's going on up there, <laughs> and it's not a great mystery. It's these kids, and I've heard several of them make the exact same statement. I grew up in church, but I've never been around anything like this. In fact, one, one student said, I didn't even know what a revival was. He said, I kept hearing them talk about revival in class, and I would look around and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Is it his fault the church he grew up in is dead? And how sad they probably don't know. How sad they probably think they are getting it done. And they may have great PR every Sunday. Folks say, oh, we felt the presence. I doubt it. But these folks, these kids, they don't know. And that's exactly what we were saying about this generation has not been disciple. A lot of them have been church. That they were church in an atmosphere, not of the presence, but of excitement and fun, mm -hmm. and cool worship, uh, cool youth pastors who knew the slick jargon and throw a little Bible verse devotional every week, and mainly just have fun with them. That's not discipleship. That's a party. 
So God is calling on his church to disciple people, yes. not to make converts out of them, not to make them good citizens, but to disciple them. Mm -hmm. A disciplined one is what disciple means. It's somebody who has learned the way from another. Y'all probably won't get into this, but every now and then I see these little videos pop up of uh, Steven Seagal. He, he was big in the 90s, one of them karate guys, <coughs> chop suey everybody and all that kind of stuff. He really is a master of Aikido. And so he, he doesn't stay in the States much anymore. He stays over in uh, Asia or in Russia. He's big friends with Putin. And he trains Putin soldiers. And so basically, in these little videos, he'll have these people, I mean, he's doing demonstrations. Gracious, he's hard on Because he'll get them and he'll say, come on. And they come in there and he'd say, and they throw this punch. He'd grab their hand and twist it all the way back. And that guy's go, oh! Then he go, pop like that and hit him up against the neck and out they go. But you know why he does that? He's discipling them. Because all these students are around him and he's showing them every move and why they do it a certain way. And then he makes them practice. That's discipleship. Discipleship is not learning a verse every week and singing Kumbaya ten times. Okay? Um, so I know some people are disappointed that um, uh, Asbury's made this decision, but it's their decision to make. They're the ones in authority there. So we'll see what the next level will be. Uh, wildfires, wildfires start with a match. So we've had the spark. And let's see what happens now. Uh, I don't know about you, but I want the flames to burn through here too. But we have to be positioned where we can handle it. And we have to, like you're seeing up there, there's a lot of humility, there's simplicity. I mean, you can talk about simple worship, it doesn't get any much simpler than what they're doing. And yes, one complaint I heard is, they just sing the same songs. <laughs> yeah, they do. And if you ever look at the camera that's coming from the back down on the stage, You'll see why. They've got all their music laid out on the piano. So they just keep playing the same set. Each group that comes up of musicians just plays the same set so they don't have to keep changing out music. The danger older Christians face is instead of getting in line with what God's doing, is standing on the sideline and critiquing That's right. what God's doing because we don't like it. Where's the hymns? You know, we remember the old meetings back in the 50s when it went this way and they're not doing anything like this. One guy said, uh, complained, he said, I went one night. First of all, they sang those courses over and over and over. So that wasn't the Lord. He called this using discernment. Uh, that wasn't the Lord. He said, and then I did not hear an evangelistic appeal. Now the irony about that is I had just heard a student deliver a more fiery message than you will hear in most churches today where he was calling people to repentance and to surrender to the Lordship of Christ over their life. So I had to comment. I said, well, gee, that's interesting. I just heard somebody call people to repentance and to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. His response was, well, I'm glad they got around to Here's the thing, it's, now this is what you can call religious criticism. We won't ever, people won't ever say, I just don't like it. Because they know they can get criticized for that. Or, 
You know, it just doesn't sound spiritual. And so they say, I'm using discernment. So discernment's been weaponized. And if I don't like what you're doing, I'll just say, in the name of discernment, uh, I can't listen to you anymore. The sad thing is, discernment is real. And it's something we're supposed to use. But we're not supposed to use it as a weapon. And I tell you what's going to happen with some of these older folks, and that's primarily who I heard doing this, they're going to miss everything. Exercising their discernment. Because they won't just admit it. I don't like it. I don't like those courses. I don't like these simple messages. I don't like that they're presenting the gospel the way they're doing it. I haven't heard anybody talk about busting hell wide open yet. And uh, I just don't like it. I don't like all them young teeny boppers up there trying to lay down a seasoned preacher up there. And just run down the list. And we miss it. So, you know, in the name of discernment, I've watched a lot of it on YouTube. You never know who's on stage. They never tell their name, at least not on there that I've heard. They rotate people out constantly. People are getting saved. People are getting healed. People are getting delivered. People are repenting. People reconciling. There's humility all over the place. So where's the problem? Where's the problem? <coughs> well, I didn't mean to get off from that. I, I said all that to say they're they're going to stop the meetings. So uh, I don't know what to come next. We'll see what happens. But what they did say about what what those young people said really did break my heart. That they grew up in church. And they, many of them don't even know the basics of the faith. And that's the other thing about what God's doing right now. This is going to be the hard, if, if that other is hard, this is going to be even harder. It's not about us. It's about them. That's right. And her. That's right. And him. And them. And them? Oh. <laughs> Jonathan, it's about the fact that the church has lost at least two generations. Yes. That's right. And the whole time thought we were really making a difference because we had exciting services. And we had cool hip youth pastors. And, and it's like Mario Murillo says, we have big screens, skinny jeans, and fog machines. And thought that would win somebody, change somebody. And we made converts, but not disciples. That's right. And so now, the world is discipling. So I'm going to do my part, and my part is to train. We're going to do some training today. We do need a youth pastor. I don't want him trained a youth guy. I mean, he'd be as square as I am. <laughs> but if he has a heart, or she has a heart, I'm okay with a woman too. Don't, don't get bent out of shape. Take it up with the Lord. But if they got a heart for for young people, that's what I want. Yes. If they want to disciple young people, that's what I want. Yes. I was at a youth conference years ago, and the guy said, he, he said, I want to tell you something about youth pastors. Just because they're cool doesn't mean they're any good. And he said, he went to a church one time, and that youth pastor pulled up in a slick, brand new uh, sport car, he said he got out of that car and he had all the latest fashion on. His hair was walked just right. And he said, man, he had all the jargon down. And he said, come on, let's go to church. And 
he got in the car and he said he thought to himself, man, this guy's the coolest youth pastor I've ever seen. He must have hundreds of teenagers in his group. He said he got to the church and they went in there to see to have their youth meeting. There was four teenagers there. In a large church. But he said not long after that, he went to speak at another church out in Texas somewhere. And he said when he, when he was outside the airport, this guy came flying up there in an old truck that's beat up. He said he got out of the truck and he had on his overalls. And he went around there and he said, hey, I'm so so I'm the youth pastor. And he said he was middle-aged, nothing cool about him whatsoever. And the youth pastor said, come on, we're going to go to church. He said he got in the truck and he thought to himself, I have made a mistake. <laughs> this guy won't have anybody at his church. He got there, there were 200 teenagers in his church. In his group. And he said, every one of them said, We're here because he loves us. That's what I want. I don't care. In fact, I probably prefer they weren't hip and trendy. Y'all might want him to take over and get me out. <laughs> <laughs> but this movement's not about us right. older people. We had our chance. The movements of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, when God gave his people, our generations, the chance to not only experience his presence, but to steward his presence so that it didn't happen again. But we didn't. The time, enjoyed it, but eventually got distracted and got other things, and then all of that just kind of settled in for a form. This is the way we do church, and we talk about the old days and how wonderful it was, and you know, throw up a lofty hope one day it may happen again. It never does, but we throw up that hope. And so God has said, I've got to come down now and clean up the mess y'all made. <laughs> And he's reaching out to the young people who, by the way, have absolutely nothing concrete to base their lives on. That's right. The culture offers them nothing. But do what you want to do. So that's what we have. Boys who don't know that they're boys. Girls who don't know that they're girls. Drugs is it's just part of life now. And sadly, many times they run into Christians who just say, you know, that's okay, Jesus loves you. He just affirms you like you are. Not the one of the Bible. The one of their imagination, man. Well, enough of that. I want to do some basic remembering today. So if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, last, not last time, but time before, we looked at Ephesians 1. And that's where Paul was reminding the Ephesian church of the big picture of why God saved them. If you remember the Ephesians, Ephesus was a very prosperous trade city. It was located on two uh, inlets that were natural harbors, plus it was located right next to the primary trade route that went from the coast to the interior of Asia. So you had a lot of money there, you had a lot of different kinds of people there, but you also had a lot of idolatry there. And this happened to be the city that was host to the temple to the goddess Artemis and was one of the cities designated as an imperial city to house the temple to the emperors who declared themselves to be gods, which was Domitian was one of the big ones. <coughs> so you have this going on, and, and Paul goes there. Uh, he, he, does, he begins to do his evangelistic work. It's very successful. Eventually, Ephesus grows into probably the largest church in Asia Minor. 
But while Paul's there and he sees all this success that's happening, uh, he knows that anytime there's success, there's going to be opposition. And so he knows he's leaving after three years, he's leaving. And, and he feels compelled to give them some kind of encouragement to never abandon sound doctrine. Now, he gets the, what motivated the writing of the letters when he gets back from his missionary journey and hears that there are deceivers in the midst. And so he's going to remind them of the doctrine that he delivered to them so that they can build their, uh, what they're doing on something solid. So if you would look at two, we're just going to look at verse one through 10. As for you, and so he's been talking all this big picture stuff about we're chosen in Christ, we're predestined in Christ. Jesus is exalted high above all other uh, powers and authorities. And then he switches gears and he says, now as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of you, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised, up, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus in order that in ages to come, he might show the incom incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, so he, he's reminding them of their life pre-Christ and post-Christ. So pre-Christ, he says, you're dead in your sin or transgressions and sin. But for the sake of time, I'll just put sin. Transgressions and sin, the word transgression is often used interchangeably with sin in the Old Testament. There's actually a little bit of distinction between them. Sin, of course, is the missing the mark, missing the bullseye. Uh, it came from archery when an archer would shoot an arrow and he was shooting for the bullseye, but the arrow went somewhere else. That's the picture we have of sin. And, and <coughs> the arrow could be close to the bullseye, but it still missed which means when it comes to sin, we can come close to obeying God, but we may still fall short. And if we do, we don't get partial credit. It's either hits the bullseye or it doesn't. Okay? And so what Paul is, is reminding them of here is that prior to Christ, we were dead in our transgressions and sins, a transgression means to cross a boundary. In moral terms, it would be to break a moral law. And here's the thing. It implies all moral law, even that that is unintentional. Now, sometimes we'll give folks a pass on unintentional things. You know, they do something that's that is simple. Maybe they just kind of in a split second made the wrong choice and they did something and, and they say, well, yeah, I did it, but I didn't mean it. Now when they say, I didn't mean it, what's that supposed to do? Take it off the books. But what Paul is saying here is with God, it doesn't. 
Because with God, prior to Christ, we're dead. We're as dead as can be. So since we're dead to Christ, to God, then there's nothing we can do through human effort to make ourselves alive to God. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're dead in our sins, and he and he goes on to say the thing that got them and us out of that condition wasn't that we were good enough, but it was that. He, out of his love and mercy, made salvation possible to us. That's the only thing that will free us from transgressions and sin. Now that's why I want to make that point. Is first of all, we live in a culture today that doesn't believe people are sinful. Whatever a person does, they believe that they have a good excuse it ought to be okay. That's why when somebody commits a murder, the first thing you hear is, why? Well, who cares? <laughs> dead is dead. <laughs> I mean, if, if you murder somebody, you say, but I really didn't mean to. I was, well, they don't come back alive. But see, it's that mindset of, well, if I have good reasons, it must be okay. And that's the culture we live in that doesn't like to think about sin. Even the church doesn't like to think about sin. We like to think like the humanists do that what people need is not salvation. What they need is self-improvement. They just need a little nudge to help them in life. And so Jesus is here to give you that nudge if you'll just give him a chance. Does that make sense? So we have to nail this down is what I'm saying. Now we all know this. I don't know that the young people know this. I hope they do. But we all have to know that apart from Christ, we're as lost as anybody else. We're as dead to God as anybody else. God is not interested at all in building our self-esteem. And could care less about whatever you think you've done that should make you qualified for his approval, for, for being right before him. Because there's nothing we can do to fix that. He fixed it. Okay? Y'all with me? We're going to get done so we can get to the lunch line. All right. He said not only were we dead in sins, but we were gratifying We were gratifying what our nature wanted, our sinful nature wanted. So I'll just say gratifying lust. All right, the picture with that phrase, gratifying lust, lust is of pulling an animal around by a rope. That when we were apart from Christ or pre-Christ, our fallen human nature was leading us around with a rope. Whatever it wanted to do, we usually find, found a way to do. Now, again, what is Paul painting here? He's painting a picture of just how dead to God we were. Apart from Christ. Now, I know some of you, I can see it on your face. You're sitting there saying, I know all of this. I know all of this. I know all of this. Do your kids. I do know. your grandkids do they know that when we told them how precious they were they were so special and heaven lost an angel when they came to be with us did they know we lied I know they're that special to us, but outside of us, it's not there. I'm sure there's, you see those people in the store and the kids just having a connection fit and mama saying, oh honey, oh honey, just saw that, I'll get you something to calm you down. Honey. That mama's probably told that kid a thousand times, you're so special, you're so wonderful. 
Oh, I haven't lost an angel when you came here. But nobody else agrees with it. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. We've got to recapture our vocabulary is what I'm saying. Because even Christianity has, in America anyway, has drifted into humanism and doesn't like to tell people anymore they're sinners. It likes to tell people, oh, you got problems. And Jesus wants to help. I, I'll tell you how Jesus wants to help. He wants to kill them. He wants that old them killed, and he wants to create a new them. He's not going to fix the past. Well, y'all still with me? Yes. I feel like we got folks walking out, so. Maybe it's just the bad preaching. Anyway. All right. So, gratifying the lust. And then he goes on to say, um, we were deserving of wrath. Now, you want to stir folks up, start preaching about wrath today. And our judgment might be an easier word to remember. You start preaching about judgment, oh, you're just, you're judging us, you're condemning it. Oh, oh, Jesus would never do that. You might want to check your Bible. And not the one that Oprah's published. Because judgment is a not only a possibility, it is a definite for those who reject Christ. Because if you don't receive Christ, you die in your sins. And one thing he didn't say that I'll put here is we're separated from God. That's another lie that's being preached today in, more, in the more success-minded churches that everybody's good with God. Just some are more gooder with God than others. <laughs> and so when it comes to salvation, nobody really needs the full dose unless they're criminals or convicts or, or, or terrorists or something like that. They need the full dose of salvation. But most folks just need a, a, a little bit. Kind of put them over the top. Because everyone's basically good. Now, I'm going to tell you the slick way that works, that gets into places, is when the preacher never talks about Jesus, but he always talks about God, and the promises of God apply to everyone. They don't. And if you don't talk about Jesus and just talk about God, what you're preaching is universalism. So quit calling yourself a Christian. Call yourself a universalist. Okay. Boy, y'all getting happy. I tell you what. <laughs> All right. We'll jump on up to post price and try to make it more possible. He said, but notice what he said. He said, we've been saved by grace. Grace means you didn't earn it. That what you earned was wrath. But God said, no, I'm going to give you grace instead. So what does grace look like? Well, Brody back there is going to be driving a car next year. And uh, we were talking about this the other day. He said, I might just drive with you to school next year, Pop. Okay, sounds good to me. Well, you know, I'm not saying he would. I'm sure he's going to be a safe driver. But uh, if he were to drive my car and wreck it and total it, I have a choice. I could condemn him, punish him, tell him, you're going to pay off my car that takes the rest of your life to do it. <laughs> or, it's okay. I'll take the cost on myself. That's grace. That's what Jesus did. You see, he didn't do nothing. Jesus did nothing to earn, to, to merit going to the cross. Our sin put him there. And because he extended grace to us, we can be forgiven and sin can be taken away. 
All right, let's go on. We're about to hang on. That lunch line's going to be waiting for you. All right, because of his great love, he's rich in mercy. Notice um, verse 5. It says, he made us alive in Christ. So where we were dead, in Christ we're made alive. Meaning you're no longer separated from God. I don't think many folks believe that because it's kind of like I've warned you about this fatalism that is so prominent around our area, maybe other places, I, I know it is here. And it's that idea, well, if God wants it to be, it will be. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, doesn't matter, you know, God, he's kind of halfway ticked off of this most of the time anyway. Because, you know, we're always missing a thousand sins before breakfast and that kind of stuff. And so God's already kind of halfway ticked off with us. But we're in a desperate situation, so we have to go to him. And I wish I had bought my cap today. So imagine that's on my head. That's my cap. And so we come into God's presence and we take our cup. Father, Lord, Lord I, God, I know you're busy. Gee whiz. And uh, I wouldn't ordinarily bother you with this, but man, there's just nothing. If somehow you could just look beyond all my thousand sins I committed before breakfast today. Oh, God, if you could find it in your heart some kind of way, you know, maybe just give me a break. You know, God, just do something. Yeah, please. I just, oh, I know, I know I don't deserve it. I know I don't deserve it. But I just, that's, that's not being alive in Christ. That's being on probation. And God doesn't put us on probation. So he said, we're made alive in Christ, and I'll just give you the next thing. And then he said, we're raised up with Christ. And then he says, we're seated with Christ. Both of those have the idea of companionship. And something... Oh, Something you do with someone else. So that means from God's perspective, when we are in Christ, when Jesus was raised from the dead, so were you. When Jesus was seated on that throne that's high above all other principalities and powers, so were you. Now see, that kind of kills fatalism. And because we're there, we're told in Scripture that all the blessings and promises of God that He has to offer us are our access. It's like having them in a bank account. And so our part of this is making the withdrawal from there. How do you make the withdrawal? By faith. By faith. And so you can come boldly to the throne of grace and say, God, I have this need. What do you want me to do? And God say, do this. And we obey. And there it is. There's the provision. Now see, that's what Paul is telling these folks. And the last one he mentions And this is where I want to end today. He says we are God's handiwork. Some translations say masterpiece. Not only are we made alive in Christ, not only are we raised up with him, not only are we seated with him, but now we're in that process of being transformed into him, into his likeness, and Paul describes that process as we're working through that maturing process of being transformed into the likeness of Christ is God is turning us into a masterpiece. The word for masterpiece or handiwork 
is the word we get poem from. Poem. God is writing a poem about your life. Michelangelo, when he was making the sculpture of David, pick a piece of chunk of marble the other sculptors had already rejected. They pushed it out there to go to wherever they dumped that kind of stuff, in the garbage stuff. He went out there and looked at it for a little bit, and he grabbed it and took it to his place. And uh, the other guys were saying, what are you doing? That, that thing's got flaws all in it. He said, I see David in it. So he started chipping away, chipping away. Of course, such a big statue took a while, and other folks got curious about what he's doing. How, how? He said, I'm, I'm making a sculpture of David. Well, how in the world are you, you gonna get a sculpture out of that? He said, I'm freeing David from the stone. <laughs> God is freeing the new us from the stone of our old life. A stone that's full of flaws and others would probably reject. But he sees David in it. He sees the finished product of us in it. So he keeps chipping away. Chipping away. Chipping away. And so Paul is describing here to the Ephesians. Listen, everything's going great right now. There's going to come a time when it's not going to be so great. When that time comes, just remember, God's still chipping away. Because he's trying to free you from the stone. Father, I thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for all these testimonies we've had today. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for showing us and reminding us in Ephesians what we were like prior to you. And Lord, if it's someone here today, that's the first time they've ever heard that. I pray that you'll drive it home in their heart. I pray that, that as it's driven home, that conviction will be birthed. That they'll see, I'm not the most precious thing in the world. I'm actually a dirty, rotten sinner. And I'm dead to God. I'm separated from God. And there's nothing I can do through human effort to fix that problem. I can never be good enough. They may try to do 99 good things, hoping that's enough, but always wonder if the goal was really 100. Help us, Lord, to recover our vocabulary. Father, for those of us who know the truth, help us to become disciples of others who don't. Help us, Lord, somehow to take this truth that you've revealed to us today on the board and apply it in the lives of others who may not know it. Whether they be lost or maybe they're saved and they really don't know what that means. They just thought they got saved, go to heaven. Give us the wisdom to know how to show them and introduce them to the mindset of a disciple. Yes. And I do thank you one last time for what you're doing in places today. Yes. Father, we, we marvel at the number of people who have come to Asbury and from all the different places around the world that they've come. But Lord, while we marvel at the numbers, don't let us forget they're coming because where they are is dry. 
is desolate, is dead. And if that means they have to fly around the world to get here, they'll do it for five minutes in your presence. May we not settle for dead. This church was born out of revival. Yes. Give us another one. Yes. 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 In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you. Hope to see you at the movie Wednesday night. If not, hope to see you next Sunday. Don't blame me for keeping you long. We have a lot of testimonies. <laughs> <laughs>